Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. Tradition to go around the room and introduce ourselves. I'm Grisha. Tony. My name is Ben. Yeah. I'm Brad. <coughs> Susan. I'm George. Peter. I'm Mike. Eric. I'm Bob. My name is Jerry. Jason. I'm Ed. I'm Larry. Joyce. Matthew. Jason. David. My name is Michael. I'm Kay. I'm Prasada Chitta. I'm uh, Ron. I'm Sue. <laughs> Sue is a writer, editor, and lay teacher at the Soto Zen in the Soto Zen tradition. She leads Buddhist retreats and teaches writing workshops in the U.S. and abroad. Her books include this is Getting Old, Zen Thoughts on Aging with Humor and Dignity. The Hidden Lamp, Stories from 25 Centuries of Awakened Women, with co-editor Florence Kaplow. And most recently, What is Zen? Plain Talk for a Beginner's Mind, with Zoketsu Norman Fisher. So welcome, Sue. Thank you. It's really great to be back here. I've been coming here for a while, and I love this sangha very much. And it's nice to see familiar faces. When we go around the room saying names, I, I can't remember anybody's name, and then, but I remember the faces. And I say, well, I'll remember that next time. <laughs> but of course, a year goes by and I don't remember. Anyway, um, but I still feel very at home here. And some of the names I know and remember. Um, so I wanted to talk to you this morning about a subject I've been thinking about a lot in the last year, which is faith. And faith is a word that we don't hear that often in, uh, in our Buddhist conversations currently. Uh, I think that's perhaps because a lot of people have negative associations with the word faith in connection with Christian background of thinking that Faith is like some dogma you have to believe in, and, and only the faithful can enter the kingdom of heaven, and, and that it's a kind of punishing word, or do you have faith? Do you have faith? But I think even in Christianity, isn't, it isn't only that, but people have that feeling about it. Um, but it, it doesn't mean that to me at all. It means something very important to me, and it does exist in... Buddhist teaching and even in early Buddhist literature, um, the the Pali word for faith is sada, which means literally to put the heart upon. So it's a heart practice. It's not about the brain. It's not about the intellect. It's about our hearts and our trust. Uh, and I want to first start by talking to you about my recent experience uh, as a monk at Tassajara Zen Mountain Center, which was a very um, intense and wonderful practice and kind of connects to the topic of faith and brings it up in different ways. So um, I don't know, have, have any of you here been to Tassajara Zen Center? Well, it's a very beautiful Zen monastery in the mountains near Carmel, and in the summer they have a guest season and people can go. It's an old hot springs resort, and guests can go there and eat delicious food and get into the baths. And, um, and in the rest of the year, it's run as a traditional Japanese Zen monastery with very arduous practice, and there's a 
three-month practice period in the fall and a three-month practice period in the winter spring, which is the one I just completed. I was there for January, February, March, and a little bit of April. I just got back 10 days ago. So um, for 90 days, I was away from civilization as we know it, <laughs> whatever that might be, and technology, no Wi-Fi, no email, no phone, basically just communication with, by, with the outside world was by mail, if you can imagine such a thing. 14 miles over a mountain dirt road to get there, no coming, no going, no travel except by my own feet, no getting into a car. Um, and so it was, uh, it was very basic and it was very cold, very wet, the weather was atrocious. We had got up extremely early in the morning, 3.30, three, three, we had sort of five day weeks. So three days out of five we got up at 3.30 and two days out of five we got to sleep in until 4.30. <coughs> um, so, but there were times to take naps and so on. There were days off every five days. So, um, there were ways of restoring yourself but it was still pretty hard and getting up in the morning going to the Zendo, managing your big umbrella with your robes on, heavy robes on with the long sleeves, dragging in the mud and trying to find your flashlight and, and not fall in a puddle and be in the freezing cold. And it was, and that was challenging. <laughs> so um, it took, it took um, but you know, the idea was that to take the backward step and shine the light inward as um, a Hei Dogen, an ancient Buddhist teacher, said. And I went to a practice period at Tassajara many years ago, 27 years ago, and it was very meaningful for me and wonderful. And I never really thought I'd do it again um, because I'm very committed to lay life and it takes a lot of doing to completely clear the decks for three months. And uh, But then I found out a couple of years ago, or a year and a half ago, that my friend, that teacher, uh, Norman Fisher, was going to be leading a practice period at Tassajara with his wife, Kathy Fisher, and um, I'm part of his sangha in the Bay Area, and I was just very excited that Norman was going to be leading it, and some of my sangha friends from the Bay Area were going to be going. And I thought, I've got to go, this is my last chance to get enlightened, I'll finally get it. <laughs> and um, so I told Norman I wanted to go, and he said, as he said to many of us, he said, oh, you don't really want to do that, do you? Do you really want to get up that early in the morning? Um, and I think he was discouraging people from coming because he didn't want to have a lot of people kind of falling into disrepair there and, and just completely <laughs> saying, wait, I wish I had not come, why did you let me go? <coughs> anyway, or getting sick or something. But I was determined. So, uh, so there I was, I got there and um, facing the cold, facing the sleep, lack of sleep, I was sleepy all this, took a lot of naps in Zazen. <laughs> um, and, and then I was also doing what I do sometimes with intensive meditation practice, which is my familiar demons came up and assaulted me and all the stories about my failures in life and all my regrets about my mistakes as a parent and my failures in love and my uh, things that projects I had never finished that were so important that I didn't complete and so on and so on. And I and how lonely I've been and um, how I just never quite got everything right in my life and so on. And, um, but you know, I'm revealing my vulnerability to you and I, you will bear with me. And I, uh, it can be very painful as I'm sure you know when you have, you have your own demons that come and torture you. And then I was sitting there thinking, what is the point? Why on earth did I come here? I'm 76 years old. This is, they call this a training center. Huh, isn't it a little late for training? I've been, I've been doing this for 40 years. I'm supposedly a teacher. And what do I think I'm training for? I said, yes, there are young people here. That's great. But why, why did I think I was coming here? And it's so self-indulgent and I should be helping people out of the world. And it's kind of not. 
So anyway, I went to Norman and um, shed my tears and said, you know, I don't, I don't really, I don't really understand why I'm here. I wasn't saying I wanted to leave. I didn't want to leave, but I just was overcome with doubt. And Norman said, you know, it's great that you're here. It's great that you came. You came because of these demons, and this is your chance to really face them and really look at it and see what is this thing about loneliness and and incompleteness and and existential angst and everything. What is it? And you can just look at it and not be afraid of it. And it will be um, maybe uncomfortable, but this is great that you're here. And so then I felt a lot better because <laughs> I thought, oh yeah, I have a purpose. I have a purpose. And there's a reason for me to be here. And um, and I couldn't leave anyway. I was 14 miles out. I mean, it was really, leaving was not a possibility. Although, about two weeks into the practice period, uh, one morning, we were told at our work circle um, that this young monk who was, I think in his 20s, who was a very appealing young man and been very kind, had walked out in the middle of the night. He had told left a note saying, it's not for me. And he'd walked over the dirt road 14 miles in the middle of the night, which, and made it safely out. Um, so, but I wasn't going to, I knew I wasn't going to do that. So, um, I just sat down. And that's what was happening. I sat down in meditation. Um, and I chopped a lot of carrots. My afternoon job was doing prep work in the kitchen, which I loved. I'd asked for that job three hours after every afternoon, chopping carrots, chopping bok choy, shredding lettuce. Um, it was very contemplative. And uh, I went to bed wearing my wool hat and my wool socks and my long underwear and occasionally even my gloves. <laughs> Um, my room, I was in a tiny little monk cell of a room, which was a very great privilege to have my own room. Some people had their own room. And it was supposedly heated, heated, but the heating wasn't really working for the first half of the practice period. And um, I just persisted. And, and somehow, after that talk with Norman, um, Fairly soon, things just swung around. Um, I, as I, as I continued to listen to the sound of the stream, which was running right by the zendo, which sound, sounded like I took it as the sound of time passing. I knew things were changing. Things were, time was going by as it does, whether you like it or not. And the stream was always there to kind of focus on. Um, and I chopped the vegetables and I sat in the hot baths in the bath time in the afternoon and I um, I was very uh, I was proud of myself for having the stamina I got out of bed in the morning when the wake up bell rang and I put on my robes and I got my cup of green tea and <coughs> went to the bus in. so um, something just turned and I um, I, was, I felt this tremendous gratitude. I felt so well taken care of by the schedule, by the, we served each other in the zendo, we had very formal meals, and, and so people were bringing me delicious food, and, and also there were people around me who knew me and loved me, and, and people around me who I knew were, saw me as an elder who was a, um, strong in my practice of many years, even though I didn't see myself that way. And, um, and I was kind of reminded that these thoughts were a habit. They were just a habit, really. And I started to really find confidence in myself. And, and I saw that I was really doing this practice wholeheartedly and with a lot of gratitude and with a lot of love for the people around me. And, um, and I just became... I just let go of this, these thoughts kind of uh, didn't seem true anymore. Uh, or they just seemed like they were 
they were true in some way, maybe, in some exaggerated way, but they were about some other person in some other time and place. And uh, I, I was able to let go of all the regrets in some sense of the, the idea of, the, if only I had done thus and so, I saw that if only, I kept telling myself, if only doesn't exist. There's no such thing as if only. If only isn't what happened. What happened, happened. You don't know what if only was. You're just making that up. And what happened, happened. Um, and if only is not what happened. And I'm here. I'm not dead. I'm old, but I'm not dead yet. And it isn't over yet. So, uh, and also this feeling that I, I needed to struggle to get what I wanted, to, to get what I needed. I don't mean the right car or anything like that, but to just get satisfaction, that feeling that I had to struggle to get satisfaction and fulfillment. Uh, dropped away. I thought, wow, I don't have to worry about myself getting something. I, I've already got everything I need. What about worrying about what I can give to other people? And just focus on that and focus on being present and, and it's all here. So um, I, I became very happy and I thought, well, you know, I mean, I was really, I was really happy and I continued basically to be happy for the whole practice period with a couple of blips. I knew there would be blips, and there was there were one or two blips. Um, but then I was able to go through those without so much. I just figured, okay, this is now. I'm just doing the work of facing the demon. So there was the one big blip was the demon about um, my a long ago marriage and how sad it was and how badly it ended and da 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 da. And then I, um, and I, thinking about that uh, was a big blip. But I, the reason I was thinking about it was because I had also decided that while I was there, since the only communication was by letter, I was going to take the opportunity during our periodic days off, each day off, I was going to write a letter to one of several people I had in my mind who have been really important to me in my life who I kind of lost touch with and wanted to reconnect with um, or wanted to communicate with. Uh, and I did that and each, I, it turned out there were only about, well there were about four or five whose addresses I had and the last one was this ex-husband of mine which was the hardest one. So I was, I wrote him a letter which came out of that period where I was going through all this stuff and um, you know it wasn't, I also knew that, that the purpose of the practice period it wasn't really for me to write letters to my ex-husband that wasn't the idea of a practice period but still yeah. it was a part of my um, facing demons so anyway I, I wrote the letter saying you know I I had really loved him and I was sorry things went awry and I knew that we'd both done the best we could and we sh and we had to be together anyway because the world without Noah and Sandy, which, who are our children, in it was unthinkable. And it was, um, and so I wished him well. And um, and then it was gone. And then I, I was done with it. And I didn't even I wasn't even thinking. Oh, I wonder if he's going to write me back. Or, um, and in fact, he did write me back a few weeks later. But after that, by that time, I'd forgotten about it. So I felt very relieved on that score. And that was the same with some of the other things that I was letting go of. And and in the meantime, I was so present in the present time. I was just saying to myself every, every day, I vow to be, I vow to be grateful for the precious opportunity of human birth. And I vow to be present. This is it. And I vow to open myself completely to the Holy Spirit. These were vows I made up for myself. And the, especially the one, I vow to be present, this is it, is kind of, was a good one for me. And I just, this is it, oh yeah, here it is. So, um, I really, I'm telling you all this because I think it's, it's really an example of a kind of faith that I had without knowing I had it. And that I gained some, I had faith, I went there with great faith in the practice. I have a lot of faith in the Dharma and, and faith in the teachings and I've been practicing for a long time and I wouldn't be doing it so for so long if I didn't have some kind of faith. 
But um, I also really realized that I had faith in myself and that if I, if I thought I had faith in the teachings, then I had to have faith in myself because the teachings are telling us all that we're all Buddha. I, you're Buddha and I'm Buddha and if I have faith in Buddha that means I have faith in myself and so that that was part of the turning that I really thought yeah it's, a, it, it's fine I don't have to worry about it I have faith in myself it's okay um, so just going back to faith in general um, it's you know I think of it as it's kind of like the force of gravity which I also I think it's a kind of a magical thing, but anyway, it's gravity is just there holding us onto the planet and keeping us from falling off into space. And we don't have to think about it, we don't have to do anything about it, it just keeps us connected. And uh, faith is like that. Faith is happening even if you don't, you don't have to do anything about it. And you, you might not be noticing it, it's kind of like the idea that you're already enlightened, you're already Buddha, you just haven't realized it yet. Well, faith is like that too, that somehow it's, a, it's just there under, under you. It's the interconnected, interconnectedness of everything. And, and in a way, uh, it's, it's kind of the opposite of belief. We think of faith sometimes in connection with the idea of belief, but belief Belief is usually meant, uh, you believe a specific thing, and belief is more intellectual, it's more particular. <coughs> Faith isn't about um, signing your name on the dotted line to anything. It's not like the loyalty oath or something, where belief might be a little bit more like that. Faith is how we can live in this world of not knowing, of uncertainty. And we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what's going on right now, even in some sense. And that not knowing is, and that ability to be with not knowing is a very precious because that's what creativity comes from, that's what open-heartedness comes from. When we already think we know what's going on and we're experts on something and we, then we're not open, we have blinders on. Um, so, faith allows us not to know, and faith allows us to have doubt. And doubt is not really the opposite of faith. There's, there's a, a need for doubt. Faith without any doubt at all is just kind of <laughs> blind faith or plain credulity or gullibility or something. But if you, if you are questioning and wondering and saying, was this, is this for me? Um, what am I doing here? What's going on? Then, then the faith that comes with that is real faith and it really, can be really helpful. Um, when I started practicing Zen, my tradition, um, at the Berkeley Zen Center in 1976. I started going there and I liked it a lot and I liked the meditation and the, and the teachings, but um, you know, there were all these patriarchal patterns and hierarchies and there was a lineage chart with all the ancestors who were all a list of dead men and I just thought, wow, what, what, this is so patriarchal, why am I coming here, is this really for me, I don't know. And I just kept coming and I kept coming and I kept coming and, and there's a ceremony we call um, lay ordination or jukai where you kind of become a Buddhist, you take your vows and you get, you sow your first little Rakasu, this is called, the, I sewed a blue one, and my teacher put my name on it when I finally did it. That's what you do. But anyway, people usually do that after a year or two of committed practice. And I was, and nine years after I'd seen people do this, and nine years later I finally thought, hmm, well, I guess this practice is for me because I've been coming for nine years. <laughs> what, what, why am I still coming if I... Um, so... Uh, it was like this invisible faith that I didn't know I had. I kind of admitted, oh, I guess I, guess I really like doing this. <laughs> I, I guess this is for me, and, and I'm not going to worry too much about some of the things that bother me. I can speak up about it or whatever. But, um, and so I, I did it. I had my ceremony, and I took my vows and everything. And I was just so happy when I did it, because I, I, 
stepped over a line into a kind of commitment instead of um, wholeheartedness. It was about being wholehearted. And, and then it was totally fine. Um, so, uh, and the same thing happened, what was it, oh, about oh, 10 years later or something, when I sewed my green rakasu and went through another ceremony, which was called the lay entrustment ceremony, where I was entrusted by Norman Fisher as a lay teacher, and that I had to go through some processes and study and so on. By that time, I wasn't, I wasn't doubting my commitment, though, but the feeling of being able to just step into something is, is something that faith can help you with, even though you don't know what's going to happen. And you can't know. You can't have everything guaranteed ahead of time. So you just go for it. You just live your life wholeheartedly. Um, so... I want to have some time for discussion and questions if there are any, but I want to share some um, some references with you first. Uh, and this is one of my favorite things uh, that we chant, one of the chants, and it's a very it's kind of untypical because it's very religious sounding, and it's. Uh, a vow written by Eihei Dogen, the Zen master in Japan. Um, he was born in 1200. Um, and the, he, he calls this Old Dogen's Vow. And I'll read um, part of it. We vow with all beings from this life on throughout countless lives to hear the true Dharma, that upon hearing it, no doubt will arise in us, nor will we lack in faith. He doesn't allow for doubt, but that's okay. Although our past evil karma has greatly accumulated, indeed being the cause and condition of obstacles in practicing the way, may all Buddhas and ancestors who have attained the Buddha way be compassionate to us and free us from karmic effects, allowing us to practice the way without hindrance. May they share with us their compassion, which fills the boundless universe with the virtue of their enlightenment and teachings. Buddhas and ancestors of old were as we, we in the future shall be Buddhas and ancestors. I love that. And then he says, um, Because the ancestors extend to us their compassion freely and without limit, we are able to attain Buddhahood and let go of the attainment. And then he quotes an old poem, which is, Those who, in, by another Zen master, Those who in past lives were not enlightened will now be enlightened. In this life, save the body, which is the fruit of many lives. Before Buddhas were enlightened, they were the same as we. Enlightened people of today are exactly as those of old. So to me, this means um, not, I, I don't particularly believe in rebirth or I don't know what happens when I die, but uh, I, don't, I don't take this literally about past lives, but that um, other people's past lives have certainly um, brought me to where I am, and that the ancestors, all our ancestors, our blood ancestors and our, our ancestors in whatever we practice, whether it's you know our ancestors in literature or in music or in any kind of teachings or skill, as well as our ancestors in our spiritual practice, all of those ancestors have helped us and given us so much and we don't, you know, it's not in our tradition in the West to think of our ancestors with great gratitude, but I've come to really appreciate that idea that I'm so grateful to the ancestors, the women ancestors as well as the men ancestors, and and the idea that, um, and then it's also that there, that we will become ancestors is kind of beautiful. That it's like the generation of leaves. The generations just keep turning over, and we in the future shall be Buddhas and ancestors. It doesn't mean that um, you have to go through any big process to. You, you might. You, know, you don't have to have a famous name or anything, but you will be an ancestor in the future to those who come after us. And it's kind of like. Joanna Macy's teachings, I don't know if some of you are familiar with her, um, 
ecological work and and she's always emphasizing that um, we need to be mindful of the generations that have come before and mindful of the generations that will follow and that we're responsible to our ancestors and to the people who are coming afterwards to um, honor what's what's gone before and what's coming later and, and our effect on it. Um, but here, just the idea that um, the Buddhas and ancestors who I, I revere and whose, whose teachings I revere were, were as we, Buddhas and ancestors were as we. They had their moments of doubt. They had their moments of thinking, who the heck am I? I don't know what's going on. I can't do this. They had those moments. And they were just like us. We're just normal people. They were people. And so we, we can get just as enlightened as they were, however enlightened that was. Well, you know, we're, we're going to be like them. Anyway, that, I find, um, gives me some faith, too. Faith that I'm part of this stream of life that goes on. So, um, I think that... Um, I think I'm going to end by reading one more um, from another another Zen teacher named Coben Chinao, who died about ten years ago or so. He taught um, in Mountain View. He had a Zen center there. Um, and this was from a talk he gave. I'm just going to read parts of it um, about who is your teacher. But he's talking also, I think, about faith and faith in oneself in the part that I'm going to read. Um, and I'm going to ask you to, uh, after I read this section, I'll, ask, I'll say some phrases and ask from the talk and ask you to say them back just in a sort of call and response thing, and we can end with that. So he says, the real, oh, he, he didn't speak very fluent English, um, so his English is kind of alive in that way. The real purpose of practice is to discover the wisdom which you have always been keeping with you. To discover yourself is to, to discover wisdom. Without discovering yourself, you can never communicate with anybody. Wisdom doesn't come from anywhere. It is always there as the exact contents of awakening. It is always there and everywhere. What you can do is to uncover it, like going to the origin of a river. Have you been to the source of a river? It is a very mystic place. You get dizzy when you stay for a while. An especially big river has several sources, and the real source, the farthest point which turns to the major stream, is moist and misty, with some kind of ancient smell, and you feel cold. You feel, this isn't the place to go in. There is no springing water, so you don't know where the source is. Actually, such a place exists in everyone, the center of us is like that. From this place, the ancient call appears. Why don't you know me? Living so many years with me, why can't you call my real name? Unfortunately, we cannot travel into such a place with this body and mind, but we feel there is such an origin, and from there everything starts. From that place you have come, actually, and whatever you do is returning to that spot. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> So, <clears throat> um, how about the real source is moist and misty with some kind of ancient smell. <laughs> now you can repeat after me. I'll say it again. This is the call and response part. <laughs> the real source is moist and misty with some kind of ancient smell. The real source is moist and misty with some kind of ancient smell. The real source is a very mystic place. The real source is a very mystic place. Whatever you do is returning to that spot. Whatever you do is returning to that spot. Okay, so I think I will end with that. And now I welcome discussion and questions and comments.
Yes. I don't remember the exact words, the setting of it, but early on you made a reference to gravity. Mm. And in my head, I thought of a very old joke, I don't know if people remember it, of gravity is not just a good idea, it's the law. Oh, yes. <laughs> and, and I thought somewhere with the word change gravity to the word faith. And what could have to say? I think that? that's great. I think that's really great, yeah. Yeah, we'll have to work on that, maybe. <laughs> no, I mean, you, the word law is what makes the gravity one a good joke, you know, because it's the law of gravity, but um, it could be, yeah, we could work on that with faith. Yeah, it's good. Law and necessity, something. Yeah, 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 absolutely. It is like that. Yes. You know, I really like what you said, because it, it resonated for me. You're talking, distinguishing between faith, and you talked about the stuff that's going on in your mind, and how challenging it is to kind of like let that go. And it, it occurred to me that, you know, <clears throat> if I had to find faith in myself, I have this like sense of knowing of some things that are true and it's recently emergent. And I've come to know that as I've gotten older and it's a place where I feel comfortable and whole and connected. And I get challenged a lot uh -huh. by the chatter of my mind. Yeah. And you know, like like you said, then you go and you talk to somebody, and then you can get, sort of get realigned. But you know, I'm always, I talk a lot about that mind chatter, but mm -hmm. it happens, and mm -hmm. it you know it becomes clearer and clearer to me that I can, you know, I, I can either choose to believe what I've come to think I know, or I can believe what the chatter in my mind which mm -hmm. always gets mm -hmm. me into trouble, and yeah. I, I forget that. Yeah, okay. and, and That's so thank what, you, yeah. thank you for reminding. Well, um, it really helps to, sometimes you need somebody else to help you with it. It could be a teacher, but it doesn't have to be a teacher. It could be a spiritual friend. I mean, we, spiritual friendship is so important, and we don't really do this by ourselves. Sometimes in moments you might do it by yourself as you're meditating or whatever, but um, friends can help. And uh, also there's, I used to have a bumper sticker on my car that finally peeled off, but uh, it's a great motto, don't believe everything you think. <laughs> and I, I could tell myself that too. You, you can use that. Don't believe everything you think. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the chatter is it's an ongoing issue. It's not over, you know, we always do that. That's what the brain does. But I think we can get more of a, more confidence about not taking it so seriously and not believing it. Yes. Um, thank you so much for the talk, and especially the, the topic um, on, on the walk over here. Mm -hmm. I was talking to my friend Joyce about faith and oh, uh, really? uh, <clears throat> how my first introduction to the idea of the, the way faith is used in Buddhism was through uh, the writings of Thich Nhat Hanh. Mm, yes. Uh, the heart of Buddhist teachings, and when they were talking about the five powers, and faith is one of them, what he had to say just, I thought it was so essential that I memorized. Oh, good, sentence, you're right. so Which jealous. is, uh, faith is the confidence we receive when we put into practice uh, a teaching that helps us overcome difficulties mm -hmm. or obtain tr transformation. So it's the first, you know, this idea that uh, unlike the Western idea of faith, which is for like belief, that this has to do with trust. Yes. And um, and it's something that uh, I really return to. It's it's what makes my practice so valuable and yeah. effective. Is that that even when things come up and you start falling back into old patterns of reaction, uh, you know, there's still that trust that yes, the, you know, that the Dharma is yeah. effective. Yeah, that's great. And sometimes you can feel like you just don't quite have contact with it. If you're really miserable or really upset or some terrible thing is happening and you're really suffering over something. And we do suffer over real things that aren't just made up in our mind, too. Um, you can still remember that underneath somewhere is the Dharma or is faith in, in these these teachings, or faith in things as they are, or faith in your life as a Buddha, as a possible Buddha. 
it's there even when you can't contact it. You can still know it's there. Have faith it's there. Have faith that faith is there. Does anybody have any stories about poetry? Here's a couple of things, whatever you want to say. Go ahead. It doesn't have to be a story. No, I really appreciate your um, presentation this morning. Um, and I, yeah, and I appreciate a few of the comments about um, gravity, because I, I like to associate with faith, and that's like faith isn't a, it, for me, like faith isn't a choice, but it can be. Yeah. Like so, and really, I just to look inwards as you described is to to see that I, there's always faith in something, or I'm in total despair. So it's yeah. not that faith is a given, but like yeah. what makes me a functional human is faith. And uh -huh. If I forget that, then I'm not just real. I'm not paying attention to what I'm putting uh -huh. faith in. Yeah. And so, and often I'm putting faith in things that aren't necessarily that beneficial. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so to take it on as a choice uh -huh. and to know that it's a reality, like it is a law, uh -huh. it's there, and uh -huh. I'm just paying, not, I'm ignoring the gravity. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and, and you can choose how you focus it in a way. Yeah. Right? yeah, it doesn't have to be a choice, but it's good when it is. Uh -huh. And um, I was thinking about this image of the, the, you know, all lots of places have, this is the Buddha's moment of, of doubt. Uh -huh. He's do, you know, the, this is actually pre pre enlightenment that image of the Buddha reaching down to touch the earth, and it's his moment of doubt when he's calling on the mm -hmm. earth to witness and give him some confidence that mm -hmm. he's not there for no good reason. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He he is reminding us that we of gravity maybe yeah. the earth <laughs> the earth that's there. Yeah, yeah, and also. What's up there, too? Sometimes he's pointing up. Yeah. Um, well, one moment I had at Tatsuhara that was a kind of a one of the wonderful moments was walking to Zazen in the early morning um, <coughs> darkness. It was almost dark. I would, and, and this was a, a clear morning. It wasn't raining, yay. Um, and I would take a little bit of an extra walk. Um, down the path just to get my body going in the morning, which I loved. And and then I would stop and look up at the stars. And and anyway, one morning I was looking up at the stars. I always felt awestruck by it because they're so bright there, and it's there's practically no light pollution. It's so the air is so the sky is so unpolluted with light that there's a big astronomical observatory there. Anyway, I was looking up, and there was Orion just sort of leaning over me, like protecting me. And I suddenly felt, yes, I am so incredibly grateful that I got to be alive in this universe, that the universe is letting me be a part of it, and I'm part of this world with all these, I mean, this realm with all these stars, and there's me and Orion and everybody else, we're all here together. Anyway, that was a kind of choosing of, of I mean, I didn't think of it as a choice, but it was a moment of putting faith in in the whole universe, in a way. I can see that, like you say, it's here, up there. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's just touching something. Yeah. Jim, what were you going to say? Oh, it's, it's very intriguing, as always, on your talks. Um, Carl Jung said something, he said, I don't have belief, I know. Mm -hmm. And it's an interesting, it's a challenging question to what do we really think we are confident enough, and, mm -hmm. um, as, and it's interesting, as much as we appreciate gravity, we don't have a sense, no clue how it works. Mm -hmm. We can anticipate it, we complain on it, but we don't know where the power comes yeah. from. Um, and I think it's a great uh, metaphor to have mm -hmm. um, for all those things we don't understand. My mm -hmm. mother torment, would torment me growing up, and I would in some dramatic crisis, and she said, oh, honey, things have a way of working out. And I said, oh, well, not this time, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, but in the long curve of her life, she was right. Yeah. And I said that once in a psychedelically inspired moment. <laughs> I, uh, I said, the faith was the experience of an idea, you know, you, you have the sensation of knowledge. Um, 
And that has stuck with me over the years, that, um, that it's an experience. It's not an idea, but it's, it's, mm -hmm. a, mm -hmm. it's something you, you feel in the depth. Yeah, it's yeah. not an idea. Right, yeah. it's not an idea. It's, it's, a, no. it's a knowledge, but not a, no. yeah. No, but thank you. That's no, you're welcome. Yes. Hi, I'm Jason. Hi, Jason. So your um, talk has given me a lot of emotional response. Um, primarily, at the started at the point where you said, "What if doesn't exist, or what if only doesn't yeah. exist?" Yeah. yeah. Um, because uh, I have some stories. Uh, so a few years back, my life fell apart when I was living for three years and four winters in Chicago, and um, the aftermath has been this past three years of if onlys mm -hmm. constantly, mm -hmm. and they've the demons have started to been fed and they're starting to you know disappear disappear um, but to hear you just say it that if only doesn't exist was really mm -hmm. nice a nice way to yeah. uh, take it in um, and then I just uh, this morning was when I was walking here I was walking by this house and this man was coming out with his daughter and his dog and then it was this guy that I've actually had, uh, I dated back when, oh. 17 years ago. Oh, and really? I actually ran into him about a year ago and he told me that uh, he now has a kid and he has a home and I was like, oh, okay. And so it's just funny to come here oh, and then run into him. I just see him and I just like said hi and walk by. Later. Yeah, and so I was here in meditation, like just meditating on like all the if onlys. And was like, that another if only? But at the same time, it wasn't because I never was really in love with him. I had like a lovely sexual moment with him, like a memory of him, but I wasn't in love with him. But still, just this comparison of yeah. like he's a lawyer and now he can afford a house in San Francisco. Oh, okay. He has a kid, oh, yeah. and now you're on this crazy artist who like, has lived this crazy artist life. But I think the thing that is coming together with what your talk also is this idea of the source yeah. and this yeah. idea like on some level I must have known that I could survive these journeys. Yeah. That yeah. even if Chicago didn't work out or my life fell apart in these certain ways, it's just the ego. And to allow that, that's been my faith over the past three yeah. years, is to really start to understand that I chose these journeys at some deep yeah. level yeah. because I kind of knew I could survive them. That's true. And, and you are surviving. Worked, right. And, and it takes a lot of courage, too. And even if my life doesn't look like his, well, that's not what my life is supposed to be. There's not, your life is supposed to look like your life, right. and that's the life that it really looks like. Right. And, and, you know, you're, to take an alternate path or to not be a successful lawyer owning a house in San Francisco is is a an alternate path. I mean, it's right. not the path your parents would have chosen no. for you, perhaps. <laughs> All the more reason that you're really following your own path. Right. Just and you can know. I mean, I'm so familiar with that. Oh, why did why didn't I? Oh. It didn't work out. The story didn't work out the way I thought it was going to. And then I realized it worked out in a different way. Right. And I'm representing something else. Other people see in me an example of something else. That I'm I'm or it's not about how what other people think necessarily, but just that I'm embodying a different life story that's equally valid, and you are too. Jim, did you start to say something? Or somebody? Oh no, but when you were talking about regrets, I, I realized just recently that there's some old regrets that I, I actually have to stand up and walk around. They're so, they're, they're yeah. so physically vivid. Yeah. At the consternation, why, why, why did yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. Well, you can, you can also, not look at them sometimes. Yeah, but yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we I, I, do we have to stop now. Yeah, we're a little bit over. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Sorry. I'll, I'll be hanging around? out for a minute. So. Yeah. I'm say be around afterwards. Yeah, I will. Okay. So thank you very much. And um, announcement. Yeah. My name is Jim. I'm your host. Um, there's hot water for tea. Um, please leave your cups in the sink and I will clean them. There are some um, edibles out here, some healthier than others. Um, uh, there's a sign-up sheet on this credential here if you want to get on the mailing list and contact us. And I'll be going around with a Donna Bowl. Donna is the power word for um, generosity and gratitude and um, your Sharon, financially with the community, pays for all of our expenses. So the people here pay for it all. So thank you very much in advance for your generosity. And um, around 12.30, some guys um, hover around the door. Um, 
to assemble a group to go to lunch and feel free to introduce yourself. Thank you. Um, I have an announcement. Uh, <laughs> on the 27th, uh, it's not next Saturday, but the following Saturday, there's a day-long retreat at Spirit Rock LGBTQ Live Retreat. Uh, it's being uh, facilitated by John Martin, who spoke here just a couple of weeks back, I think. Anyway, I'm registered, um, and I rented a car, so uh, if anybody was planning on going uh, and wants to carpool up there with me, And, <laughs> this is, maybe, I don't know how zen this is, but uh, um, we have an extra ticket <laughs> uh, for um, a tribute to Laura Dern at the Castro Theater this afternoon. Uh, it, it's at 3.30, right? Yeah, if anybody would be interested, we could have an extra ticket. Yeah, for free. Okay, okay um, next week, April 21st, Eve Decker will be our teacher. Eve Decker has been practicing insight meditation since 1991 and has taught groups, day-longs, and short retreats since 2006, particularly at Spirit Rock, the East Bay Meditation Center, and elsewhere in the Bay Area. She is a graduate of UC Berkeley and of Spirit Rock's Path of Engagement and Community Dharma training programs and has been trained in Hakomi approach to uh, body-based psychotherapy. Eve is also a singer-songwriter who has combined the power of music and dharma practice. Um, so she'll be here next, next time. And I think that's it. Shall we get it out of Let's kill these. No, I did, but I was afraid of. Oh, not over the water. Oh, okay. That's just, he's good, just water. <laughs> this is out of cleaning service. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you moist. Uh, yeah, moist. Yeah, <laughs> uh, moist and misty place. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Jim, I'll do that one. Do you have any special dedication, or should I read yours? Uh, go ahead with yours. Okay. Uh, by the power and truth of this practice, may all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all be free from sorrow and the causes of sorrow. May all never be separated from the sacred happiness, which is without sorrow. And may all live in equanimity, without too much attachment or too much aversion, believing in the equality of all that lives. Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, please subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org.